Okay, so, and welcome again. Dr. Libby Larson is a, your third round at the last event, <laughs> last event of She Festival. And uh, we, we all appreciate so much for your being with us. And, and now is a great time to listen to your yeah, intimate talk, right, mm -hmm. about your life as a composer and a woman. <laughs> so, okay, I will give now the microphone to the Dr. Larson, over it again. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, okay. <laughs> well, this is lovely. It's lovely to continue uh, with so, so many of you uh, and, uh, and to meet uh, some, some, new, some new people too. It's uh, really uh, a, a pleasure um, and an honor. Uh, to for us to be together uh, in, uh, in the ways that we can. Uh, uh, it's just uh, soul renewing. Uh, it's really, really, really wonderful. And um, we have um, uh, maybe about a half hour. Um, uh, I'm I, uh, offered uh, to uh, just kind of talk about uh, m really my life as a composer. Uh, uh, hopefully generating some questions uh, and, um, and some discussion uh, among us. Um, we don't often get opportunities, I think, to just like be together and talk about what it's like. Uh, uh, and, um, and this is great. So um, I, I uh, made myself a little outline. Um, uh, some of you who were in the composition uh, seminar, uh, Ryan and Matt and Carter and, um, and, and Bob, of course, you, you'll recognize a little bit of this uh, in the beginning, and then I'll just take off from there. But um, uh, uh, so I'll just start. Um, I uh, uh, hindsight um, it tells me that 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 I'm an odd duck. <laughs> that um, I uh, I uh, uh, really um, all all my life uh, uh, had a passion. And still do, and probably will well beyond this life, um, for um, communicating what it's like to be alive by making pieces of music about it. Um, it's just the way that I think and the way that I communicate, uh, and and where that's brought me in this lifetime is to the the profession of composition, uh, which is a profession made up of many careers. Uh, it, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, profession um, and not at all what I thought it was going to be when I said, I think I'll be a composer, which that happened uh, in my er early on in college. Um, so, so I'm going to just kind of just lay out the path of, of, of what it's like in 30 minutes. <laughs> so, um, so like, uh, like uh, I think, like most all of us, unless unless you're a wunderkind and you're born into a, a you know a, a family of royalty musicians. You know, we're probably all very similar. That you know, we we uh, I had a um, uh, a fairly typical Midwestern uh, uh, middle class uh, Caucasian uh, upbringing, uh, uh, um, which included uh, I have four sisters, uh, no brothers, so it was a, a family of five, fairly boisterous family. Uh, uh, my parents, who um, uh, my my background typical American background, right? Where do you come from? You know, well, from Delaware, but you know, uh, um, my ancestry is, uh, is Scandinavian, uh, uh, Danish and Norwegian, uh, Alsatian and German, with a little bit of Irish. So um, my, and who knows what else, but you know, but um, the way that my parents decided that they, they would, um, raise five, uh, a family of five, was by making a bunch of rules that we all had to do at the same, you know, no matter what, you did this at this certain age. So for instance, uh, in, in my family, uh, we, we all took piano, uh, which is a kind of a post-Victorian, you know, parlor thing to do uh, in, uh, in a Midwestern Caucasian family is you take piano and then at uh, uh, family gatherings, uh, your mother asks you to play piano and you don't want to do it, but you do and nobody listens, you know, and then everybody goes, yay. You know? <laughs> so, so that's part of my background. Uh, 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 and um, 
I, uh, I wanted to start studying piano when I was three. Uh, uh, but um, in our family, you had to wait till you were seven. So I, I spent a, a great deal of time at the piano watching my sister's hands move up and down the keyboard, uh, uh, just kind of staring down the keyboard, watching their hands move, uh, uh, and then waiting for them to get done. And then I would um, get up on the piano bench and make pieces of music, which, which were basically sound sculptures. You know, they, they, they're what sounded good to me. But, and I would get off the bench and then I would ask anybody around, what what do you think? <laughs> and people, you know, uh, and, and I still do that. That's what I do. <laughs> you know? I, I write pieces of music and then I, you know, work with performers and, and well, here's the thing is that um, uh, it, this talk is about my life as a composer, you know, and um, it, um, and, um, my brain um, thinks in music. W when, when I enter a new unknown space, the first thing I do is sort everything out by sound. Um, not sight and not smell and not, I just sort out all the sound. Uh, and, um, and I've done that, uh, I can't, I, I think I was born, born that way. And it got me into a lot of trouble when I was young. Um, a lot of trouble because I communicate in sound. So, um, so as a kid, I was um, uh, 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 always either put right in front of the teacher or in the back in the corner uh, uh, so that I could make sound or, or not make sound. Now I'm telling, telling you that because it's really, it, it's really, it's really shaped the passion I have for finding ways to make sound that, 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 um, that communicate what it's like to be alive. Uh, and, and I do that by working with um, performers, performers who also make sound on, you know, whatever instruments that, that we have uh, available and they change. You know, um, so, um, so as a, as a little kid, I, I went through a Catholic grade school. I learned how to read and write music. I, um, I have a very fast brain that doesn't think in a line. It thinks uh, uh, dis in disconnected ways, it's a very creative brain, um, but it got me into trouble a lot. Um, uh, uh, and, so, um, and so I spent a lot of time um, uh, uh, inside my own head uh, so that I wouldn't get, get in trouble. You know, uh, uh, and I spent a lot of time in the principal's office when I would get in trouble just because I would just blurt something out. I was a blurter, you know, all the way to my last day of my last PhD uh, uh, class when Dominic Argeno had to shush me. So he would just be quiet. You know, I can't help it. I just make sound. Uh, so anyway, um, <clears throat> my upbringing was, was really pretty typical. Grade school, I went to a public high school. I, uh, I sang in the choirs, I took piano. Uh, I sang in a rock band. I, I loved, loved, loved um, uh, uh, any kind of music, except I don't really like uh, bluegrass. But um, if it would just move out of first position, I might like it more. But uh, <laughs> uh, who knows, maybe we could do that. But uh, uh, I just, uh, and so by the time I finished uh, public high school, um, and went to the University of Minnesota the same way all my sisters did because we all did the same things at the same times whether we wanted to or not. You know, I uh, I uh, uh, thought I would either study music, uh, uh, but not to write it, um, to perform it. I thought that uh, what I could do with music was to sing at the Metropolitan Opera, um, and that that would be, of course, my natural path. <laughs> uh, 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 or I was going to be a stockbroker, either a stockbroker or a famous opera singer. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and at 17, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Uh, uh, but, uh, and I learned, though, that in studying music, um, what, what I hadn't learned up until that point, even though I could read it and write it and, uh, and wrote a lot of music, uh, a lot of choir music, a lot of piano music, but in music, uh, uh, um, what I didn't know was how music was put together. I just didn't, I, 
I just didn't had never had a mentor in uh, in the theory and architecture of music of any kind, of any kind. So I, you know, it's not Allegro or 12 bar blues. I don't know, I had no idea until I went to college, you know, uh, uh, and, um, and had an outlet. Now this was in the 1970s, no internet. So you, you, you went to places you thought you could learn. Uh, uh, and um, so I went to, went to the University of Minnesota, started to study music um, and quickly learned um, uh, uh, a couple of things. One was that I knew an awful lot about music, really a lot about music. But I didn't know much about the classical canon, the classical canon of music that make that that is the foundation of, of uh, uh, music education, systems of music education. That's changing now, uh, but not very fast, but it's changing. But at that time, I didn't know the Beethoven symphonies. I played some, I played a lot of Bach, but I didn't understand that that was great. <laughs> I just play, I played Bach and I played Boogie and I played, you know, I, I just played a lot of music and I loved it and I loved it all. But when I went to college and I began to understand that there, there is a system of learning uh, um, that could, that, that, that I could wrap my brain around. Um, uh, that's when I began to understand that really what I wanted to do was what I'd been doing all along was to compose, to make new pieces of music. Um, and that my job for myself was I knew how to make pieces of music. That, that wasn't a problem. What I didn't know was how to make the decisions I was making. I had no idea about what was happening instinctually. And so, so, um, so composition uh, uh, for, for, for me uh, is, is, the, is my lifelong quest to, to know the choices that I'm making. You know, so that I have choices, that, so that I, so that I know that if I am writing a piece for saxophone and piano, and that piece is holy roller, and um, and I want the form to be the form of an evangelical uh, preacher's sermon, you, you know, that I know what all those things are, you know, and then can become a servant to my instincts by bringing all the technique that that I have uh, it, to bear on an idea. Um, now, okay, so so that's where I that's where I started in college, thinking, okay, I'll be a composer. That'll be it. Then, um, uh, then my life as a composer, as a composer, kind of started, um, and it and it it's um, it's been. I, I try to break it down into three areas, which you know, of course, it's not any life lived as a you know as a rich tapestry every moment of every day. But it seems like there that in order to do sustain as long as I have um, uh, a, a way to practice what I love, which is to write pieces of music, kind of three three areas. Um, um, one of one of course uh, is to develop the all the all the musical techniques and skills that I possibly can uh, to to make the pieces that I want to write. Um, and, and of course, that, that means study all the time. The instruments have changed so much over the last 50 years. Tempos have changed so much over the last 50 years. The culture, everything changes every day. So there's a, 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 a tremendously rich uh, uh, field um, of knowledge that, um, that I, I pursue all the time. I analyze any piece of music I can get my hands on. I, I, uh, I, I listen to uh, and try to work with the best possible performers I can, performers who are so much better than I am at writing for their instrument, you know, uh, so, that I, uh, um, so, that, so that we can make something beyond both of us. Um, I, uh, 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 I stick every day to um, two things that I ask myself. One is, is that, um, am I writing about what I know? Because, I, because for me, composition, uh, my definition is to make a shape of sound in time and space in order to communicate what it's like to be alive. And for me, it's checking in with what do I think I know? You know, what do I think I know enough about so that I can uh, uh, make a piece of music through, through it? So a lot of my pieces, like uh, Four on the Floor, which was an early chamber music piece, is about freeway driving, really fast freeway driving. 
you know, pre freeways were built it, across this country in 1964 when I was in eighth grade. So five years later, you, you know, uh, my whole generation, you know, we, we were out there in our stick shift cars going way too fast. <laughs> I'm, you know, <laughs> you know, and uh, and um, and we were we were practicing a kind of speed that is now considered lentil in our culture, but really fast then. So, you know, so what was it like to be alive, um, having technology um, at your hands as, um, as a young person who doesn't really think about consequences? That, to me, that's where you get a temple for a piece of music. Uh, you know, um, uh, am I making sense? I see some people nodding and others are going like, what? <laughs> so, um, that, uh, so, so I asked myself, um, am I writing about something that I know? you know, uh, every day. And the other thing I ask myself is, am I actually ready to compose today? You know, am I prepared to compose today? You know, and, and, and that's a personal thing that each one of us, you know, uh, knows, are you ready to actually make music today? You know, and some days, absolutely. Some days, no way, not ready to make music, you know. Uh, but, and then, then as, a, as a mature musician, you know, the, the, the um, I, I deal with, if I'm not ready, um, how can I make myself ready? You know, not, I'm not gonna do it. You know, but I, how can I make myself ready? If I am ready to respect that and give myself the time and the space to make the music that, that needs to be made. And these are all challenges in, in, in my world, at least. I, I'm not on a faculty, so I, I um, uh, which is, uh, which is something that I, I said of myself is, do I want to join a faculty? When, when I um, uh, got my doctorate in music composition, uh, that was in 78, 1978, or was it 79? Can't remember, but um, uh, at, at that point in time, the, um, the, if you got a doctorate in music composition, there was a path for you, one, and that was to join a faculty. That, that was the future for a PhD in, in, uh, in music composition. Um, and at the time, um, I thought, and a bunch of my friends, we were all pursuing it, and we said to each other, well, what's the matter? Why isn't there a future? Because we didn't know our past. You know, uh, now, now we know that our teachers were really the first generation of professorial comp composers uh, in this country, uh, trying to uh, trying to set themselves in place in departments all over the country, which, which they did. And then, then we were their first generation of students, you know, of, of graduates, of students. And there weren't jobs for us, for many of us. Many got jobs, many didn't, but there, it wasn't, there wasn't a, a, a career path to follow. So my, so what I did, I skipped high school, but we all know what high school is like. Anyway, so, so what I did is, I, is um, with my friends, uh, uh, there were, we had a really wonderful group of friends at the University of Minnesota. We're, we were all working on our doctorates. And we all got together and said, what's, what's our future? Uh, and, and we said, um, whatever we make, that's our future, whatever it is. Um, and then we, we decided it was kind of an extraordinary time. Poets were doing this, playwrights were doing this, artists, you know, uh, in their 20s, late 20s, uh, who, uh, you know, were, were all kind of getting together and saying, what, what's the future of the independent artist in America? Quite different than it is in Europe. And so we started talking about what, do we, you know, um, we, have to, we, we have to make a future for ourselves. Uh, and, and that future is going to exist in, in, in many, many, many pockets and, and, and many ways. Um, so, um, so, so this is the, an, another tributary of, of my life really is, um, uh, is um, what um, is, is the profession of careers that I talked about. That um, what, what we did is we formed an organization, a collective of composers and collectives were being formed all over the country of, of composers. You know, um, we were all uh, thinking, um, who do we write for? You know, uh, who, who wants to listen to what we have to say? And, you know, and how can we uh, uh, 
uh, connect those things together. Uh, and, um, and so we, we started an organization. Uh, in my case, we, we started a group called the Minnesota Composers Forum, group of composers in Minnesota. You know, um, uh, uh, and we, you know, we took ourselves, very, actually, we took ourselves very seriously. Um, we got stationary. That's the first thing we did was get stationary with a letterhead because we were all too chicken to call people up. But if we, <laughs> if we wrote them a letter on, on letterhead and then called them afterwards, that made us official. So, you know, so we, 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 we figured out, we, we figured out ways to be real, you know, in, in the world, to be real in the concert world of the time, which is the same concert world we've got today. It has a canon. That canon is not a canon that includes contemporary composers. You know, I know now from having spent a lot of time at the Library of Congress thinking about this, I know why that is, but it is. So we, so, so, so all of us relied on each other to understand that if we were going to grow in the profession that we were also inventing at the same time, that some of us would be fat, wonderful professors. Some of us would be record producers. Uh, uh, um, some of us um, would become publishers. Um, some of us would be great administrators. All of us would be all those things a little bit. All those things a little bit. No silos. So in, so in, um, in, in my group of composers, uh, uh, one was a uh, one is a fellow named Steve Barnett, who you know working on his doctorate, part of the Minnesota Composers Forum, has gotten twenty five Grammys as a producer. He just went into record producing. He said, "Okay, I'm going that direction." Great composer, but said, "I'll go that." Way. So um, uh, a, a, another one, Daryl Newell. Wow, he design, He's the guy who designs the winger shells um, that we that we all use. We. You know, um, each one of us, we all just talked to each other and said, you know, what do you want to do? <laughs> and, and then we all wrote music and we put on concerts and we made recordings and we, you know, did all of the, uh, we learned to do all of the things that we all do, you know, um, as musicians. So that's that part. Then the other part is, um, uh, oh, good, I'm, I'm staying on schedule. Um, I, I know I'm saying a lot of things, but I'm hoping to generate just questions. Um, I, um, we, we have to and to, I wanted to, we all wanted to learn what the profession was, the pre profession of co composing uh, uh, it, uh, in our country. And so um, I, um, we, we had the Minnesota Composers Forum, it's now the American Composers Forum. You know, we, we, we had that as our, 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 our home group. Our, our way of talking with each other about what are the needs now, because the needs change, uh, the, uh, the instruments change, the delivery systems change, the cultures change, the tastes change, you know. Um, and so, so the fact that we could all that we can and do, those of us who are still here, you know, we talk to each other quite often about what does it what does it look like right now, you know, and and how can I make shapes of sound in time and space. No, in the in the world as it is now. So, but um, um, uh, I got involved in um, in I guess you'd call it the professional politics side. So I I I um, learned the, also my friend Steve Paulus. We both of us learned a lot about the American um, ASCAP, uh, which is the American Society of Composers and Publishers. We learned a, a lot about it. Uh, enough so that we've both been on, Steve's been on the board of directors, for, I was on the, a, a different um, board there to get kind of inside uh, and learn what associations we all have. Now, um, uh, each one of our instruments has, has a professional association, like the International Double Reed Society or, or uh, the uh, NATS, or, you know, there, we each have trade associations uh, and so I got also involved in, in, in the trade associations that could, even if they weren't, that could welcome new voices into them. So the um, Meet the Composer, uh, which is now called New Music America, which wasn't, well, it is an organization for composers uh, to en engage with their audiences. 
with no definition of what kind of music, not, not style of music, just the fact that one makes music, one performs music, they come together, sometimes they're together, and people listen to music. Uh, uh, also, um, I got involved for a long time with um, what is called the, the, the League of American Symphony Orchestras. I um, became um, fascinated um, with the fact that we that that there seemed to be, and this is the composer in me, and also a little righteous indignation, you know that that in each community there is an where there's an orchestra, the orchestra loudly proclaims that it is the pinnacle of the pyramid, you know the pièce de résistance. That's the thing. If, you know if if we can just all aspire to orchestra, whatever it is, that it's great for the culture. And I just always kind of went, <laughs> um, uh, huh? <laughs> uh, and I and I uh, uh, and so I, I I love to write for orchestra. It's a fabulous instrument of uh, of instruments. Uh, but but the or, the orchestra in our in our country, the orchestra is um, is an industry. Um, and it's built on the factory model. Uh, it, uh, uh, and, um, uh, and it has line workers uh, and, you know, very skilled, what, you know, really highly skilled, but the model is a, a production line model. Uh, uh, and, and there is no research and development uh, in it. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a repackaging industry, repackaging Mozart, Brahms, you know, uh, 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 the Messiah, you know, uh, great pieces of music, but somehow the composer, that's me, you, you know, we sort of, sometimes we come in as a project, you know, like a fanfare project, an orchestra, will, you know, or, or an event, but we're not part of the, of the fabric uh, of symphony orchestras. Uh, so I got all involved in that. Um, I write a lot of a lot of opera. I just love, love to write opera and, um, uh, and uh, have been on the, uh, the um, uh, American Opera, uh, the board of directors there. Uh, and um, so, so whenever I, I, I just try to find what is the system, you know, of performance for, for the music that we want to write and where, where do we fit in it? Um, so um, it, it's, a, it's an amazingly rich fabric of life being a professional composer. Uh, 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 it, uh, in this country, we have no uh, government support for uh, for composers. We used to. Uh, uh, there were, there was a period of time when uh, when composers, poets, uh, uh, choreographers, when individual artists were really pretty well supported by the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, and that was a system that was carefully constructed um, and completely taken apart. Uh, through, through politics, so that um, no individual artist, unless you're a writer, uh, can get funding for your own ideas. Uh, it, you, you have to go through a, a performing organization and help them realize their idea with your, your talent uh, now. Uh, so um, let's see, what else can I tell you? Uh, 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 I've told you an awful lot. It's like it's dropping the whole globe on you. Boom, here, here you go. Okay. Very great. And uh, you generated us so many, so many things in so many ways. So <laughs> now is the time to bring some questions. Any questions? Yes. Ah. Yeah, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about, uh, do you still live on Lake Minnetonka? <laughs> yes, I do. Talk, just a little bit about the nature, the, the, the uh, relationship between your music and the natural scene around where your lake is and the difference of the season, the spring, summer, fall, winter, walking on the ice, just how, how that relates to your music. Yes, I, I can. I forgot to say, you know, that there are certain themes that uh, that I return to again and again and again, um, and um, and one of them is nature. Is, um, 
where where I live in, in Minnesota, uh, uh, we, we have four definite seasons. Uh, 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 it's spring and summer and uh, fall and winter, and they're really they're really def you know they're really defined. Uh, um, one of the uh, and 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 I am bound to water. I've I've always lived near a lake, uh, lake, lake water in particular. I love the ocean uh, and I love rivers, but uh, but I'm bound to lakes. <laughs> they're 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 ringed in, and you can see, uh, you can feel and be part of how the the play of temperature and wind and uh, and light and. Um, so um, I, I live on uh, uh, um, two lakes, actually. Uh, uh, in, in, in town, I live on a lake called Lake of the Isles, uh, 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 which is a, a very much a city lake. It has paths all around it, and people use it uh, for, uh, for, you know, not, not for swimming. It's not so good for swimming, but, uh, you know, uh, kayaking, uh, uh, any kind of um, frozen water. <laughs> activities you can think of, uh, uh, and um, uh, and then I also I have a, a little house on a lake called Lake Minnetonka, which is what you're you're talking about, Bob. Which is uh, oh, uh, Lake Minnetonka has 500 miles of lakeshore, uh, but it's all in bays, so you, you you can't see the 500. You you just discover it bay by bay by bay. And we live on um, on uh, 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 Smithtown Bay. Doesn't matter the name. Uh, um, but um, uh, it, it, I, I'm, I'm happiest and I've always been happiest when I'm outside, you know, not in a building. Uh, uh, I, uh, my Catholic upbringing uh, uh, came to a halt. <laughs> uh, uh, not that you would notice, I went to Catholic school through eighth grade, but I, um, once I discovered that I could skip church and go climb a, a particular tree, uh, um, I started doing that uh, when I was pretty young, you know, uh, and just sat in that tree on, on Sunday mornings. And so um, uh, it, in my music, a, a, a lot, a lot are really the, the cycles of nature, the rhythms of nature, the, um, uh, that kind of, we were talking in class today about flow. Uh, and, and Juan Garcia and I were working on a song, uh, a song today that has really got much more flow than it does meter. You, you know, and it, it, it's almost as if you're in a, a, a on a boat. Just, just all the the natural, uh, 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 anything natural it, uh, is to me uh, potential music. I've written uh, I've written tornadoes. <laughs> I'm, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, anything. So yeah, nature, definitely. Another thing is speed. I really love speed, going really fast. Uh, uh, that's hard to do for uh, in art song, but it's it's not so hard to do in instrumental music. You know, it's to really take things beyond uh, beyond the beyond their point. Uh, yeah, speed is another, and mysticism is another. Is um, what's incomprehensible uh, I, uh, I, uh, is to me. Uh, I, uh, I don't think I don't know if you can capture it in music, uh, but we sure can try. You know what's what's incomprehensible. Music, in in terms of mysticism, music is a can be a pretty meager attempt to. No, to to get at infinity, uh, but I try. I try. You know, from time to time. Thank you. Okay, students. Now it's your turn. I do have a question. Okay. So I was really intrigued by a, your your comparison of modern American the the culture around orchestra uh comparing that to to like a, a factory where we're just kind of pumping out the same produce things over and over again what is the composer's role in changing that that's a really great question 
I guess I would start by thinking to myself, what do we want it to change into? It, um, and I'll just throw out my own thoughts about it. I, I would like the orchestra to change into, to, to change, to morph um, into an, an ensemble that can creatively embrace the sounds of instruments which are much more relevant to our culture, our culture at large, uh, uh, than it currently does. So for instance, saxophone, uh, you know, is the instrument that I just love, you know, and the saxophone um, is not part of the complement of a symphony orchestra. It's, it's an added instrument. And the saxophone was deliberately kept out of the symphony orchestra complement. Um, when the orchestra in this country in the early 1940s uh, uh, decided that it would say, this is what a symphony orchestra is. It's the, uh, the orchestra that we know, you know, that's in all our universities, you know that um, that's um, that orchestra was um, uh, was uh, that definition was formed in the early 1940s and all of the business around it, you know the the budgeting, the contracting, the, you know, all those things. I would like that to change. I think that by now, you know, a, a symphony orchestra, meaning this meaning an instrument of instruments in this culture, it ought to have a full bank of of uh, well, it ought to have. A, a, a choir of saxophones. It ought to have a, a choir of, of electronic instruments. It, just, it shouldn't be an also ran in the percussion section. You know, uh, uh, mixed sound, me meaning uh, meaning uh, 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 mediated sound through speakers. You know, ought to be integrated right into the ensemble. You, you know, it is in places in in um, we hear in mixed sound much more than we hear in acoustic sound. Yeah, in our culture, and we ought to just say, "Yep, that's right. We do." You know, uh, and you know, it, we have the inst we've developed the instruments, the speakers, and all the instruments that we've developed in our own culture, and the music that we've developed on them, ought to be part of the part of the symphonic experience, along with Beethoven and and Wagner and Brahms. But the but the orchestra itself, the mechanism of the orchestra itself, will not allow it. They'll experiment with it, you know, but they won't allow it, even though they subsidize. Do you know? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm getting. I'm stepping off my soapbox now. You can ask me anything you want, but I, I, I won't say unless you ask me. <laughs> and you ask, what can we do about it? Uh, I asked. I guess I just asked what the what the composer's role is in in kind of subverting that or changing it or expanding upon it. Well. Um, for a while, composers just quit writing for orchestra. They just kind of walked away from it, you know. Uh, and um, uh, that's one thing that can happen, you know. It's uh, is that composers say, "Not interested, Charlie." You know, I'm gonna spend my time doing something else, and the energy of the audience goes with the composers. It, that's uh, uh, now uh, and now because now it's kind of an interesting time for composers. Because the orchestras themselves, because of COVID, they've had to um, rethink how they give concerts. You know, uh, and so many orchestras are doing uh, a, a, a virtual series. Um, almost all orchestras are not playing with the full complement, maybe twenty-five at the most. So they need to look for repertoire, because because they've been feeding on their own repertoire for so long. Now you know. Now they're looking for repertoire. And that's an opportunity for composers to say, "Got it, you know. Here we are. We're here to help." But you know, and so th so that's that is a door that is opening. And I think if, if we composers um, come in with technique and repertoire and joy, uh, that um, that's that will be exciting, you know. Uh, and and excitement uh, is it always brings audiences. What brings audiences is passion. No, passionate playing, and uh, uh, that's that's what brings audiences. No matter how men, how big your marketing department is, you no, know, composers have passion. So. 
but we have to do it. We can't wait to be asked. That's one thing I've learned in my life early on is, is you don't wait to be you don't wait to be invited. You just stand in the middle of the road and say, da da, <laughs> here, here I am. I got this piece. I've got these great performers. Have you heard of you know this person? You just get right in the middle and and don't move. Thank you so much. And then may we have another question? May I ask a question? Oh, sure. This is uh, Theodore Rolfs. It's wonderful to speak with you, Dr. Larson. And, and I loved your music today. It's, I'm getting my first exposures to it. Um, in, in class today, you spoke of your bias toward American Broadway diction and yeah. vocal technique as opposed to bel canto style. And I was wondering if you could expound in a little more detail about your life journey <clears throat> through vocal music, the influences and experience. And as a second question to follow up, how do you feel about the influence of the microphone recording and, and or live microphone on our voice culture since it, since it evolved, uh, it, it became a part of uh, Broadway, uh, you know, in, since the 50s? Yes. Two excellent questions and two big topics. Um, my um, my coming to the belief that you know, coming coming to my own preference for uh, 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 American diction or American English uh, uh, it is is really uh, through my own exposure as you know as a listener to uh, uh, to music all all my life. You know, um, uh, almost all of my experience until until college um, uh, uh, was um, either either a choral experience where I was singing in a choir, uh, um, uh, or uh, or listening to music that was recorded. You know, that, that was mostly recorded. I didn't go to the opera, the acoustic opera. You know, I did listen to lots and lots and lots of acoustic recorded music, uh, but recorded, which means mediated, which means microphones, which means a different kind of vocal production. Um, and I think that's, a, you know, we're alluding to Broadway is now pretty much all mic'd, but it wasn't before. Uh, but American, uh, um, uh, so um, uh, I, I, um, hmm. um, when I was little, uh, all of the Gregorian chant that I sang was was Latin. You know, so I sang in Latin or English, Latin or English. You know, until I got to to college uh, and um, started studying voice, and um, then was you know put into the classical bel canto training. You know, uh, 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 singing Caro Mio Bene instead of Hey There Georgie Girl. Uh, 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 and um, and thinking to myself, but they're both actually really good for the voice. <laughs> they both extend range and what happened. I started thinking, ah, if we're training the musculature of our voices, you know, um, from a language that isn't the language we speak, then what happens when we sing in the language we speak when um, it, um, in ways that it's that it's not heard? Am I making sense to you? Anyway, I had to unmute. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, um, uh, so for instance, um, yeah, this is really gone. It's really a tap to me. So, um, so, um, I, I, I have a couple of pseudonyms uh, that I use uh, to write lyrics for choral music, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, there's a whole choral piece uh, that I wrote in the style of Jack Kerouac. Uh, 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 I wrote the, the words, and the words are, hey, you, I love you a lot, a whole bunch, very much, forever. Those, that, those are the words. Uh, to, um, and so there's not very many words, uh, but, there's, uh, uh, but we have some interesting um, issues in it. Hey, you. Hey, you. you no, know, that, that's not Italian. You know, and and uh, the, the vocal production for, for the way you say hey, and boy, teachers, please, you know, jump all over me here. But you know, it's uh, it, it's a, it's a different way of making the vowel, you know, to sing hey rather than a ha, 
a whole or you no know, it has to be hey you because that's the that's it it's that hey you <laughs> you know in order to make the the impact and um, and so I've, I've heard this piece uh, uh, many times it's for, for women's choir it's kind of a brash man kind of piece uh, and um, uh, and I've heard it sung in brash American English you know um, which means a bright very bright sound it's not a long sound it's it's a bright and in the forward of uh, forward part of the face and it's a different feel than when I've heard it sung in British English. Uh, uh, girls choirs are, 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 are often trained a little bit more like British boys choirs to have that, that pure sound. And so going like, hey, you, I love you, is very different than, hey, you, no, I love you very much, very, very much. It's very different than, hey, you, I love you very much, very, very much. And, and, it, and it has a different relevance to uh, emotional relevance uh, 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 in performance if the audience is part of your process. And for me, the audience is part of my process. I want to reach right into their hearts and get them. So, um, so, so I, I, I try where I can to have good conversations with really great uh, studio teachers, many of whom are in the room right now. About how do we teach American English diction, you know, at the same time we're teaching bel canto diction. Um, and um, it's fertile ground, it's, it's fertile ground, but it's particularly fertile ground for composers, you know, when you're choosing what text you're going to, going to set. You know, if you choose Elizabeth Barrett Browning, which I have, you know, that's quite different than choosing Mae Sarton, who is an uh, American poet and it's different techniques that need to be applied and, uh, uh, and different outcomes, uh, uh, depending on how much you know, you know about where you're going. I can't, it's like, <laughs> like singing James, I, uh, I, uh, James Brown is, is one of my heroes and Chuck Berry is another one of my heroes. And, um, uh, and so uh, musical heroes and heroes, you know, they're in many, many ways. So I, so I thought, wonder what it's like work with notated Chuck Berry and notated James Brown. So I went to Schmidt's music and, uh, and I said, do you have any, you know, James Brown? <laughs> and so they, they said, oh, yes, we have this piano, you know, uh, volume of, of James Brown. Uh, and uh, uh, and um, so I, I, I bought it uh, and I, I dig into it and I understand what the conundrum is here of trying to bring a system of music notation and music performance and the training for that musical performance of trying to bring that system together with music that is not part of that system and was not even evolved from part of that system, trying to bring it together, um, which is where I think I live is to try to bring them together more on the art side than on, the, but to try to, to try to do that is, is really, really difficult because we have a thousand years of evolution, you know, uh, uh, of both, from both, you know, from both camps of music or all three camp, five camps, you, you know, uh, uh, and yet we have one system here in the university that really is evolved from a thousand years of one particular way of expressing sound in infinity. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you again. And now we have a round, so 10 minutes around to end. I may take one more, one more question to Dr. Larson, do you have any? Can I ask a question? Oh. Uh, Who is the first? Uh, oh, go ahead. I, I saw Matt had his hand up. Great. Okay, so then let's go Matt and uh, is that a Carter? Yeah. Okay, let's do that too. Yes. Okay, Matt, would you please? Yeah. Um, so Dr. Larson, uh, is it true that you've spent most of your most of your professional career in the Twin Cities area? 
most of my domestic okay. life is in the Twin Cities area. Yes, that's true. Yeah. That's where so I have. I, yeah. I wanted to ask if you had maybe pros or cons or advice for for people in maybe like the flux time of life um, about about being rooted in a, partic a particular community of artists versus um, versus trying to be transient and be mingling with artists from um, like a broad range of communities. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think it does. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, for me, uh, uh, that period of time I was talking about when a bunch of us composers, we were all with each other and we were all talking about what the future would be. And, uh, you know, that's an extraordinary kind of energy. Uh, you, you, you know, uh, uh, when, when I, and it's happened three or four times in, in my life, you know, that I found myself with a group of people that when we come together, you know, it happens. <laughs> and, um, and it, it's not, an, and, and I think um, in, in the Twin Cities, when that group of people came together, you know, we just wanted to make it happen and we didn't care where it was. We were just making it happen, you know? And I think that is the most important thing is to get yourself with people who are going to propel you like that, propel the art, you know, because then you end up propelling your careers. Um, bang on a can is a, is a good, you, have you guys heard of bang on a can, anybody? Yeah, bang on a can is you know is another example of this. Is that they, these guys were all friends, and and when and when they worked together, it happened. You know the um, oh I've forgotten the name of the canyon. It's it's in um, it's in Hollywood, and it's a particular can canyon, and all the rock bands lived there at one point in time. Uh, you, you know, but you know so that you are together. You know, and what happens is at least what's happened. This has been my experience several times now, is that when you are with the people that, that, that spark you, you, you know, and you stick with them, then you make great work and people hear about it and they come to you. You know, the going out, you know, uh, is, um, is, is part of it too, but it doesn't feed, the, it doesn't feed you in the same way. It, it, um, and, and oftentimes it can enervate you. You know, because it takes a lot of time to go out, out and around. Yeah. Um, Queen is a good example of a group of group, you know, when they came together, it happened and boy, did it happen. You know, then they started going out and then, and then they got back together and happened again. But um, um, I, I imagine that's, you're thinking about where should, where, where where's your next move, you know, uh, uh, and um, um I think it should, I, I bet you know what it is. You know, who you wanna be around for the next phase of your life? You know, wh what talent do you wanna be around? Who, who do you wanna, who do you wanna talk to? You no, know, and, and um, I, I think that that, it's like, it's like going to, you know, if you are going to study with a voice teacher, you, you know, you, you know that you, you know, then you start looking for the voice teacher you want to be around. It's like you want to be around. So, you know, so for a while, a couple of years ago, I, I I even said to to my husband, I said, "Gee, if I were if I were your age, your age, Matt, you know, I'd move to Brooklyn." You, you know, uh, about six years before that, you moved to Amsterdam. You know, and um, then there there was a period of time when you you moved to Berlin. You know, but what was happening is artists were, you know, people were like getting together to, to spark each other, uh, to spark each other's work. And, um, and you know, I, I, that's what I would say, you know, is, is, is go where the energy is, you know, and, um, and then, but be very aware of the business too. Thank you so much. And now, Kara, 
Oh, yeah, Carter, go ahead. Okay, I'll try to make it quick. Uh, I'm a huge fan of your uh, your chamber music and the stuff you've written for Low Strings. And uh, I remember you were talking earlier about uh, thinking about going into economics. Um, and you already had such a really strong music background. Um, at the time, did you ever wonder if the two might inform each other? And uh, do you see that in the, uh, like with newer composers today, do you see them using these sort of like multidisciplinary backgrounds to uh, compose for, not necessarily for like a compose, but in a more abstract form, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I understand what you're saying. And um, at the time, I didn't think that, you, you know, I didn't think, but now, but I learned pretty quickly that what really brought me where I was, was that I really like if then propositions, which is economics. It, you know, if this is in place and if that is in place, then this will happen, you know, or let's see what will happen if certain principles are in place. Um, and, um, uh, and that I transfer over, uh, you know, in many, in many abstract ways, uh, you know, into the composition that I do. And um, I, uh, I, I find it very exciting to do cross-disciplinary thinking about you know, uh, that, that ends up sounding like music, <laughs> you know, uh, for instance, uh, I uh, have, uh, am always looking for what form, what forms our culture is evolving. You know, since we didn't evolve the fugue or the sonata allegro or the rondo, you know, but what forms are we evolving to hold, um, uh, to, uh, to hold a, a, a narrative, whatever that is, you know, and emotional content. So for instance, freeway driving, uh, you know, um, that is a music, that's an available musical form. You know, you get in your car, you go to the entrance ramp, you begin, you get onto the freeway, all kinds of stuff can happen, you know, and there's a lot of emotional things that, that are happening. You get off, it ends, that's, that's an available, Musical form, like or the evangelistic preacher, that's a that's a form. Or architecture, Edgar Varese. I don't know if you know much of his music, but um, uh, uh, early part of the 1900s uh, uh, was influenced by architecture, clearly, and you know, and stated that he was, and talked about music in vectors, you know, and in, in ways that Stravinsky wasn't talking about, because Stravinsky was a culminating genius, and Varese was you know, was a generating uh, genius. Uh, uh, so um, I, I, I actually think that for any composer, you know, anything is available, you know, to cross, cross reference. It, it, anything is available. Uh, it just depending on how the composer you, you, um, puts them together in, in, in the brain and comes out with sound whatever that is. I, I, I do believe that. I was composing an egg carton form for a while. <laughs> wow. but, yeah. Thank you so, so much. Yes. Oh, I, I actually have a thousand questions here on chat window, but that is a scheduled time until eight o'clock. Now is one minute. Wow. And, yeah, that's what, yeah. So we had a wonderful, inspiring, aspiring, and meaningful time is really more than appreciated. We have a really grateful opportunity to have this, um, uh, what is it? Dr. Larson, Libby Larson, and uh, I want to close this uh, beautiful event as a, the last moment with uh, Dr. Larson. I already read this one before the voice uh, or the performer master class today, but uh, I maybe uh, the meaning and uh, the meaning of this statement would give it another meaning. Okay, so I may read this. Music exists in an infinity of sound. I think of all music as exciting, uh, no, sorry, existing in the substance of the air itself. It is the composer's task to order and make sense of sound in time and space to communicate something about being alive through music. Libby Larson, thank you so, so much.
Thank you. And uh, everyone, so we had a beautiful uh, time together and appreciate your participant and you know, our beautiful questions. And uh, so we will see again and again in a different space and different time, of course. And we will share the love of the music too. Thank you again, Dr. Larson. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.